So everyone close your eyes for a second and imagine that you're curled up and nice and warm in a sleeping bag. You're in a shotgun shack in the middle of an Arctic tundra field in rural Alaska. Now you haven't slept more than four hours a day for the last month. Your last shower was about three weeks ago. Now you need to go climb into your cold, bloody fishing gear to go out at night on a rough tide because the nets are packed with fish. And if you don't pull them out, they're all going to go to waste. This is how I've spent my summers for the last 22 years. I'm a third generation salmon gillnet fisherman and I work in Naknek, Alaska. Now, some of you may be wondering why I would subject myself to this sort of thing. <laughs> the best answer I have is that it's who I am. It gets in your blood after a while, and as you can see, it's actually pretty great sometimes. So this is the town of Naknek where I fish. And even though I didn't grow up here, I feel like Naknek is sort of my home village. Now, rural communities like this in Alaska are typically microgrids. What I mean by that is, they generate their own electricity, they are not connected electrically to another village, and they don't buy or receive any of their power from a larger grid. So villages like Naknek have a problem. The cost of power is high, and it's only going up. Despite the best efforts of the co-op utility in Naknek, the electrical cost of power is 59 cents a kilowatt hour. In nearby communities, I've seen it as high as a dollar a kilowatt hour. Put that into perspective, I pay about 10 cents a kilowatt hour living here in Bellingham. Now, rural Alaskans spend something like 48% of their take-home income on power. So imagine just taking half of your paycheck and using it to pay for one basic necessity. And then think about how that must impact people living in these communities. I met a woman living and working for a village council of a community near Naknek, and one winter she ran out of money to pay her heating and electrical bills. Now the village council, her employer, didn't want her to freeze to death, so they negotiated a wage garnishment with her. She's garnished to the tune of about $28,000 a year to pay for heating and electrical. Just think about that for a second. To put that into comparison, I pay $1,500 a year for the same services living in Bellingham. Now, the extraordinarily high cost of power in these communities has a number of negative effects, such as it makes business development tricky, and it also, since the cost of living is so high, it also means that a lot of young people are leaving and not coming back. I believe that the viability of these communities is important, and that's one of the reasons I work in renewable energy. The other is climate change. Alaska sees the effects of climate change firsthand more than almost any other place I know. There are a number of villages being physically picked up and moved away from the coast due to rapidly increasing coastal erosion. The town of Kevalina here will actually be underwater in three years unless the town can figure out how to prevent it because FEMA can't do anything for them since it's not a disaster yet. Now, the, where I work, Bristol Bay, my family has seen ocean temperatures as high as 70 degrees. Now, that's a big deal because Bristol Bay is the easternmost arm of the Bering Sea. So that's really warm. And warmer water can't support as much oxygen, can't hold as much oxygen, so big schools of fish like this can't enter when the bay's that warm. And that's a really bad thing for the fishery and for the planet, because Bristol Bay is where 50% or so of the world's supply of salmon comes from. So you should care about this issue at the very least if you like eating fish. <laughs> now, all the microgrids in Alaska cumulatively produce about 363,000 tons of CO2 annually. That's to produce electricity for about 100,000 people. I'm not counting emissions from space heating or vehicle use. I'm also not taking into account that in many communities, the fuel consumed must be flown in, not always on big planes either. So greening up Alaska's microgrids will not solve climate change, but it will be a big step in the right direction. 
All the Alaskans that I know, myself included, love the environment, and many of them depend on it for their way of life. They don't pollute the air or pay a high price for electricity because they want to. In many of these places, there is no other option but diesel. I think it's important to give them an option, which is why I decided to take a job as a solar developer. So after two years in the Washington State solar industry, I went to work for Capstone Solutions in Redmond, and together we created a microgrid solar program for rural Alaska. And so far, we built this. There we go. That is the largest solar array in the state of Alaska currently, and it's only about a mile from my summer fishing cabins, which is pretty cool. So we set out to put this in to prove that you could install solar in rural Alaska for a reasonable amount of money. And we've succeeded at that. Along the way, we also proved that you can install solar in rural Alaska for a reasonable amount of money in almost any location. And what I mean by that is if you walk down the hill from where this photo is taken out to those solar panels and you jump up and down vigorously, the ground will actually ripple around you, which is a disconcerting feeling. And what's going on there is you're standing on about this much tundra. Below that is a soupy morass that uh, geotechnical engineers politely call loon feces. And then below that is frozen ash from a volcanic eruption. Top that off with the fact that this whole site freezes over in the wintertime, and this was one of the most complicated installations I've ever seen, yet we still managed to get this system in and do it for a reasonable amount of money. Now, our next target installation is going to be a true small-scale village microgrid system. It'll have integrated diesels, which the village will already have. It'll have solar and it'll have batteries. And here's how it'll work. In the summertime, when we've got a lot of light, the solar array will produce enough power to run the entire community. And there'll be a battery sitting over here topped off in case we have cloud cover or something like that. Now, when the sun starts to set, and the solar array produces less and less electricity, the battery will contribute electricity to the grid, and together the solar and battery will run the entire village. Now eventually the battery will reach a point where it tells the generators to go ahead and turn on, and the generators will slowly turn on, and then they'll assume the load. Now in the morning, when the sun comes back out, the solar array will start producing more and more electricity, and a lot of that will be dumped into the battery to charge it all the way back up. When the battery is full again, it'll tell the generators to shut off, and the battery and the solar will again assume the load of the village. So the system I just described will obviously work better in the summer, worse in the winter, somewhere in between the shoulder seasons. But that system can reduce the diesel consumption of a diesel microgrid village in Alaska by up to 50%. And that's pretty big, because we're talking about solar in Alaska. <laughs> so. The best part is, if these deals are structured correctly, these communities don't even have to pay for the upfront cost of installation. They just have to buy power for less than they're already paying for their diesel power under what's called a buy-sale leaseback agreement. So this is also not new technology. We're not creating something really all that new. Uh, Capstone Solutions, along with a lot of other companies, already does microgrid work for the telecom industry and other industries. A big telecom site really isn't much different from a small village in terms of electrical demand. We're not reinventing the wheel, and it really helps that the cost of solar equipment has fallen probably about 80% in the last five years or so. So the time is now. Now, as I've been progressing in my career, I've started looking farther afield outside of Alaska, and I've started to think about the fact that in many places, systems like this will work better than they work in Alaska because, let's face it, as we said before, Alaska is not famous for being sunny. So along the way, I saw a TED talk by the late, great Hans Rosling, titled The Magic Washing Machine, and I encourage you all to go see it. In The Magic Washing Machine, Hans says that five billion people don't have access to grid electricity. What I mean by that is they can't go flip on a light switch or plug something into the wall and expect anything to happen. So there's a number of reasons why these people don't have electricity. Obviously, there's the financial constraint. But I think the bigger reason is that trying to develop a fully integrated grid across the continent of Africa or Asia or South America is an enormous undertaking from a geographical standpoint. Those continents are huge. 
There's a reason why the United States microgrid or grid is considered a modern marvel of engineering. So for that reason, I believe that many of those five billion people will eventually gain access to electricity, to grid electricity, through microgrids, like what villages in Alaska use. And that could be a problem. Let me show you why. So this is a photograph taken from space of Africa and Europe. Now down here in Africa, you have about 1.2 billion people living there. Up in Europe, you have about 750 million. Look at the light density difference of Africa and Europe at night. And imagine if Africa was lit up like Europe. Now imagine how much power that require, and then think about the fact that a lot of that power might be coming from diesel microgrids, like in Alaska. Remember that 100,000 people in Alaska that create 363,000 tons of CO2 for electricity? Just imagine if that were 5 billion people generating electricity the same way. That's pretty bad news for us. If we want to survive climate change as a species, we need to start making renewable energy microgrids the obvious choice, not just in Alaska, but all over the world. It should be clear by now that this is not a third world problem. This is a global problem. This will affect all of us, even if it's hard to realize that. So a favorite author of mine once said, if we all do a little, we're only going to achieve a little. But if we all do a lot, we can achieve a lot. Now, how many people have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews? Me too. My newborn sitting right there in the front row. And I can tell you that if we don't do something now, then they're going to be suffering. So help me to make renewable energy microgrids a reality all over the world, not just for us, but also for our kids. Thank you.